This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Tarask. One of the joys of doing this podcast is that we always learn something new. In fact, that's one of the major rules we follow when writing an episode. We must learn something new in the process of researching and writing a script. We can't just regurgitate stuff we already know. And what did we learn from putting this episode together? We learned that there is a not insubstantial slice of the gaming community that is obsessed with the question of who would win in a fight, Godzilla or the Tarasque. There are tons and tons of posts and forum threads about it. It's a huge thing, a gargantuan thing. And based on the few dozen we glanced through, it's not just a massive issue. The participants are also fiercely passionate, and the arguments tend to take on a life of their own. They gather momentum, and then they are just unstoppable forces of pure geeky nature. Which is another facet of these discussions. They are so filled with fiery passion that whoever manages to win a particular skirmish, everyone loses. As the two sides battle it out, the flame wars and insults just leave a swath of destruction in their wake. Once the argument is over and the dust settles, there's just this sad, gloomy silence. And people crawl out of the rubble and start rebuilding their community. Now, to be fair, we can't say that we really actually learned something completely new and unexpected. The who would win in a fight thing is hardly new. On the internet, It has been an honest-to-goodness meme since 2010 when a 4chan user posted an image simply asking people who would win and then presented pictures of Solid Snake, a super spy from Konami and Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear video game series, and Sam Fisher, a super spy from Ubisoft's Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell. And we should note that even though the series is called Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell because the espionage and thriller author Tom Clancy endorsed the series and because the series is inspired by his novels and because his company Rubicon owns the brand Splinter Cell, he actually didn't have much to do with the development of the series. In fact, the character Sam Fisher and the organization to which he belongs were created by Ubisoft writer J.T. Petty and the character was designed by Martin Kaya. But we digress. The point is that 2010 was the birth of a particular form of the who would win in a fight meme that has gained substantial popularity since. But the question itself is far older. It's a popular staple of nerd culture, but it's also a popular staple of sports culture. Speculating about the outcome of particular athletic matchups has been a favorite topic of discussion for fans of various sports, especially boxing and wrestling, for as long as those sports have existed. That was the basis for a fun little event which pitted American baseball legend Babe Ruth against the legendary cricket player Don Bradman in 1932. The event itself didn't really resolve the question of who would win. It merely consisted of Bradman teaching Ruth how to bat cricket style, and then Ruth taking Bradman to a baseball game and teaching him the rules. But it started as fan speculation. And who would win is even a feature of literature and mythology going back for ages. One example among many we turned up was when the mystery author Maurice LeBlanc wrote a book in which he pitted his own detective character Arsène Lupin against the world-famous Sherlock Holmes. Of course, if you go looking for that story these days, you'll find it as Arsène Lupin versus Sherlock Holmes. Because Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, complained to such a degree that LeBlanc changed the title and established the whole thing as a parody work. And that's not even to discuss the hundreds and hundreds of crossover events in comics that pit various members of different companies' heroic rosters against each other, or the games that pit said comic book characters against video game characters a la the now 20-year-old series of Marvel vs. Capcom games which actually started basically with the question of whether Wolverine of the X-Men could take out Street Fighter's Chung Li in a fight. Considering he's an immortal, regenerating dude with a skeleton made of indestructible metal and she's a talented martial artist with a penchant for noodle bowls, 
certain allowances had to be made for the game to be anywhere near competitive. So it's not at all surprising that gamers would want to pit the king of movie monsters, Godzilla, against the king of Dungeons and Dragons monsters, the Tarrasque. But what is interesting is that the question is sort of moot, because while you might suspect the Tarrasque has its origins in Western mythology, and you'd be right, the D&D monster actually appears to have a lot more in common with the Eastern movie star and might even have been included in the game to fill the Godzilla role. Let's start with the Tarrasque from D&D. The Tarrasque is a gargantuan abomination. And since the year 2000, it has appeared in the core roster of monsters for every released edition of D&D. And discounting gods and primordials and other entities that have the literal powers of creation... The Tarrasque is the most powerful thing that exists. It is a massive, chaotic, eating machine. Its basic cycle is this. It lies dormant for a bunch of years. And then it wakes up and goes on a destructive eating and killing spree. It stomps towns to dust, devours livestock and people, smashes forests, and leaves a barren wasteland in its wake. Once it has sated its appetite, it goes back to sleep underground. The other thing to know about the Trask is that it's practically indestructible. It cannot be killed by normal means. Its hide deflects most attacks leveled against it. And up until 2008, with the fourth edition of the game, any injury it did suffer healed fairly quickly thanks to its regeneration. Beyond that, even if a massive army or a particularly stalwart group of heroes did manage to deal it enough damage to kill it, it wouldn't actually stay dead. It would just go dormant. Or grow back. Or something. It depends on the addition. Nope, if you wanted it to stay dead, you had to use some pretty high-level magic after you killed it to make the death actually stick. Otherwise, it would just keep returning. The details vary from edition to edition a bit, but those cover the basics. And although the Tarrasque was not part of the core D&D monster lineup before 2000, it was actually invented back in 1983 and presented in the Monster Manual 2 supplement to the first edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and then reappeared in the second volume of the Monsters Compendium for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd edition. So it's pretty much an iconic beast in every edition. Fortunately, except for a brief suggestion in the wacky Dungeons and Dragons in Space setting that there might be a planet of Tarrasques somewhere in the cosmos and that on their own planet the Tarrasques are actually peaceful creatures that only eat rocks and it was only traveling to other planets that made them rapacious and angry killing machines, the Tarrasque is also a unique entity. There is one. It is not a Tarrasque. It is a singular entity. It's a THE Tarrasque. And every inhabitant of the mortal world is pretty grateful for that. Now, the name Tarrasque was not something that E. Gary Gygax merely invented for this engine of destruction. The name actually goes back a long way. It was first attested somewhere between 1187 and 1212 in a description of the life and times of Mary Magdalene's sister and her dragon-slaying adventures in France. No, really. Now, Mary Magdalene is a complicated biblical figure. A lot of people know a lot of things about her, but a lot of the stuff they know, well, it may not be totally accurate. She's gone through a lot of transformations through the many years. She's been a prostitute, a nun, a maid, an icon of a secret cult, part of a massive biblical conspiracy, and even a feminist icon. That's because she's one of those iconic figures to whom a lot gets ascribed based on whatever cultural zeitgeist happens to dominate the time period in question. In the Gospels of the New Testament, Mary of Magdala a town on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Mary of Magdala was a follower and friend of Jesus's. In fact, she's depicted as his most faithful follower. When Jesus was arrested and his followers abandoned him, 
Mary stayed by his side. She was present at his crucifixion and even waiting outside his tomb after he was resurrected. And there are some suggestions of a close physical relationship between Jesus and Mary. Basically, they kissed. Also, Jesus brought Mary's brother back from the dead. See, Mary had two siblings, Martha and Lazarus, and they were all fans of Jesus. And pretty good friends as well. But Jesus was not popular in Bethany, where the siblings were living. It was under the sway of the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem, and by this point, the Jewish priests had started to turn against Jesus as a false savior. So the situation was complicated when Lazarus got sick. Mary and Martha sent Jesus a letter about Lazarus' illness, but for various reasons that have been interpreted in a number of ways, Jesus didn't hurry to Bethany. By the time he got there, Lazarus had died of his illness, and Mary and Martha were pretty inconsolable with grief. Jesus reassured them that Lazarus would live again, and the girls were like, yeah, we know, resurrected at the end of time to go to the kingdom of heaven, but that's not alive again now, is it? And that is when Jesus issued his famous proclamation. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Which has become a central line in many Christian prayers and ceremonies. Jesus then ordered the tomb of Lazarus opened and yelled, Come out, Lazarus! And he did. And he was fine. Anyway, Mary was an important and faithful follower and friend to Jesus Christ, but that was about all the Bible had to say on the subject. But sometime between the first and third century, a cult appeared centered around Mary, and artwork of the time started to embellish the story. And this is where, as near as scholars can tell, the story of Mary as a repentant prostitute got started, and other details got layered on by her fans over the years. Which brings us to the region of Provence in southern France and this book that shows up sometime around 1200 CE and specifically to the town of Tarascon. The book was called The Life of St. Martha and it was supposedly an account of various events that had happened 1200 years prior in the town. According to the story, after Jesus had ascended to heaven and his followers were being heavily persecuted, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, along with a couple of their other girlfriends, who happened to be named Mary as well, fled to the region that would eventually become France, specifically Provence, specifically Tarascon. And Martha had built a church there. But Tarascon had a problem, and the problem was a monster. Now, the monster lived in the forest on the banks of the Rhone River. And it was said to be the offspring of the biblical sea serpent Leviathan and Abanacus, which was basically a legendary cow monster that pooped fire at people. No, we're not making that up. The monster itself was dragon-like, part bull or ox, and part fish. It attacked travelers crossing the river and had foiled all attempts to slay it because it would just go hide underwater whenever anyone attacked it. Well, St. Martha did what any good saint would do. She marched out into the forest, found the beast, doused it in holy water, and brandished her cross at it, which took away all its powers and made it docile. Then she tied the thing with her girdle and led it into town. And as the bound beast stood quiet and docile as a lamb, the townsfolk beat it to death with spears and rocks. And the creature was named the Tarasque, which basically just means the monster of Tarascon. See? So the mythical Tarasque was basically a dragon. Heck, this is the third story we've told about a Christian saint who tamed a dragon that was terrorizing the land with holy power and then led it to town to be slaughtered by the people it was preying on. Remember St. George? Remember the gargoyle? Dragons all. Which is why, when people say, did you know the Tarasque is based on a legendary French monster? We kind of laugh and say, 
If you mean the name was based on a legendary French monster, then yes, yes we did. But the monster itself? Not so much. See, there's another pedigree that a lot of gamers, us included, theorize really informed the Tarasque. And it, ironically, includes the pedigree of the very creature that other gamers are always pitting against the poor Tarasque. Let's talk about Godzilla. Godzilla is, of course, a giant reptilian monster that is featured in around three dozen films from two different continents, as well as a score of video games, comic books, and other media. He's an example of what are called these days a kaiju, or more accurately a daikaiju, or more accurately still a monster, because those words just mean monster. Well, monster plus a sense of alienness or strangeness, so, weird monster, mysterious monster. The thing is, the genre of kaiju films is pretty much a very recent way of describing the movies. Now, the Godzilla franchise these days is carrying a lot of extra weight. There's a lot of stuff that's gotten layered on over the years. For example, there's a level of cheesiness usually associated with the franchise. People in rubber monster suits smashing miniature cardboard cities while pyrotechnic effects that look like 4th of July fireworks go off all around it. Or in the case of some of the modern remakes, massive summer blockbuster spectacles with huge special effects budgets and mostly just their scripts and bland acting. But that's kind of like all the stuff people know about Mary Magdalene. It came later and got layered on as the zeitgeist changed. So let's talk about where Godzilla came from. Let's travel back to Japan in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The thing with Japan is it's pretty prone to natural disasters. It lies upon and basically owes its existence to one of the most seismically active geological features in the world, the Pacific Rim, the Ring of Fire. We've talked before about how the crust of the Earth is divided into separate slabs of rock moving over a semi-plastic, superheated rock ooze, and how, where those plates meet, you get volcanoes and earthquakes. Well, Japan is sitting right above a particularly nasty meeting point of the Pacific Plate, the Eurasian Plate, and the Philippine Plate. So Japan suffers from a lot of earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis. And because of where it sits in relation to wind and water currents, it's also prone to getting slammed with massive storms called typhoons. Weathering disaster is part of the Japanese identity. Sadly. And then, in 1945, the list of disasters included the distinction of hosting the only two cities in the history of humankind ever to be destroyed by atomic bombs. In a nutshell, while the German Nazi party had started a conquest in Europe and aligned itself with the fascist government of Italy, Japan had started a similarly brutal conquest of China, Korea, and parts of Russia, and across various islands of the Pacific. And they ended up aligned with Germany as well. And then, Japan made the mistake of attacking America directly at Pearl Harbor along with numerous other Pacific locations. Naturally, war followed, and America started to push the Japanese into a retreat. But the Japanese were unrelenting and didn't consider surrender an option, and an invasion of the Japanese islands would have been extremely costly. After the Japanese forces refused to relent to conventional bombing attacks, the Americans warned the Japanese that they had a new weapon— a bomb of such terrible power it would wipe cities off the map. The Japanese, already having weathered massive bombings by the United States, were unimpressed by the threat. And so, America unleashed two nuclear bombs on Japan, one at Hiroshima and one at Nagasaki, devastating the two cities and forcing the Japanese to surrender and end their war of aggression. The atomic bombs had a massive effect on the general population of Japan. They were unlike any attack ever unleashed. After the end of World War II, American forces occupied Japan for some time, partly to ensure the war would not reignite and partly to help rebuild the nation's devastated infrastructure. 
So in the wake of the destruction, Japan also experienced an influx of American culture. And in 1952 and 53, two films reached Japan from American studios. First, there was King Kong, a film about a building-sized ape terrorizing New York City. And the second was The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, about a dinosaur awakened in the Arctic by an atomic bomb test terrorizing New York City. And both films were hits in Japan. Meanwhile, the shadow of nuclear devastation still loomed over Japan itself, and they were continually reminded of the disaster as the United States continued to test new and powerful atomic bombs in the Pacific. And the U.S. made sure the world knew they had those weapons. See, an arms race was starting between the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, which had grown out of the Russian Empire, and both wanted the other to know who would win in a fight. And the reminder became particularly stark in 1954, when a Japanese fishing boat, the Lucky Dragon 5, was caught in the fallout from an American nuclear test and the crew died from the radiation poisoning. And all of this swirled in the mind of a filmmaker named Tomoyuki Tanaka at Toho Studios when he found himself with a slot to fill after funding for one of his projects fell through. And he penned a movie about a giant monster created accidentally during an American nuclear test that would emerge from the sea, cut a swath of unrelenting destruction across Japan, and prove to be indestructible by any conventional means. In the end, the monster could only be destroyed by unleashing an even more powerful weapon than the atomic bomb, despite the risk of escalation. The monster, by the way, was named Gojira. That's a combination of the English word gorilla with a Japanese word that means whale. Gojira was Americanized as Godzilla. Now, Tanaka wanted to work quickly. He wanted to strike while the memory of the American monster films was still fresh and while news of the American nuclear tests and the fishing boat disaster were still topical. And so he had to make some budgetary concessions. Most importantly, he couldn't employ the stop-motion animation techniques the American films used. It was too slow and too expensive a process. Instead, he decided to dress an actor as the monster and film him rampaging across a miniature city set. But it worked. It all worked. The film resonated with the Japanese audience. It was part disaster movie and part warning about the dangers of nuclear weapons and the current arms race. And the monster was not a monster at all. It was an unrelenting force of nature, completely indestructible. And even in the end, when it was supposedly killed, the scientist character speculates that it probably survived or that others of its kind likely existed. And it was only a matter of time before they were awakened. So basically, you had a dormant creature, an unstoppable force of nature, who could only be killed by extraordinary means and would probably come back eventually even after being killed. Given how much other pop culture inspired Gygax, it's not unreasonable to think he was inspired by the giant monster movie franchise. Of course, once something becomes popular, people start layering on all sorts of other stuff. The original cautionary tale slash disaster movie gave rise to a series of movies about giant rubber monsters punching each other and destroying cities. Other characters, other monsters, got added to the mix. As the fear of nuclear weapons waxed and waned throughout the decades that followed, and the rise and fall of the Cold War, the tone of the film shifted back and forth from deadly serious disaster to seriously funny spectacle. But what really changed the film series, from serious disaster to camp spectacle, was the third film in the franchise, made in 1962. When someone asked, who would win in a fight? Godzilla or King Kong? And after that film hit theaters, the genre of two giant monsters fighting it out for the title of King of All Monsters was born. But frankly, we're actually not all that interested in that question. Which makes us bad geeks, we guess. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. 
You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>